Hey everyone, Miss Go Electric here, and today I'm in Monrovia, California. Behind me is a research and development facility. If you drive an EV, they might be working on some stuff that's pretty important to you. So let's head inside and find out what Wabasto does. Well, hello there. Are you Michael? Yes, hello Michael. Miss Go Electric. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having us here. You guys, this is the Global Director of Research and Development here at Wabasto. How cool is this? You're gonna show us around today, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, come on in. Thank you. Wow, it looks like there is a lot going on in here in this testing facility and I cannot wait to tour it with you. But first, I wanna sit down and hear a little bit more background about the company because a lot of people probably haven't heard of Wabasto, but you guys are a huge business, aren't you? Yes, we are. All right, let's sit down and talk a little bit more about what you guys have right. going on. Thank you, Michael, for sitting down with me to talk a little bit more about the company. And this is something that I want to really um, open up to the audience. What is Wabasto? Because you guys, although it's not a household name, you do over $4 billion in business a year, and that's a big deal. So can you give us an idea of what Webasto does and all the categories you service? Of course. Um, yeah, first of all, Webasto is a German automotive supplier, and we are market leader for sunroofs and convertibles, heating systems. Um, and since 2016, we started to get into the e-mobility products. So we started to develop and produce high-voltage batteries, high-voltage heaters, and also charging systems for electric cars as we want to support the, the trans, transition to electric mobility. So you have facilities in Germany, that's like your main headquarters, right? But obviously we're here in Monrovia. Why did you guys pick to put a facility here and where are your other facilities throughout the world? Yeah. That's right, our headquarters is in, in, in the south of, um, of Germany. And we picked Monrovia because we were acquiring um, the charging division of AV and AV Aerovironment is a, in the end the inventor of the EVSEs. So they invented the charger or the EVSE for the GM EV1 um, wow. a long time ago. And yeah, we had the chance to acquire this part of the company and um, since 2018 we are here in Monrovia with Webasto. Interesting. Now, where is this built? Because you do all the testing here, but as I understand it, you manufacture the device elsewhere, right? That's right. Testing and development is done here. Um, so the, our Webasto mobile cord set, the Webasto Go, has been developed here in Monrovia and the production is done in Mexico. We have a plant that is just specifically um, for charging um, that is currently built. Um, at the moment we are sharing the facility with the roof division. How long have you been building this device? Because this has been around for a little bit, right? That's correct. So we are producing it since 2020 and the first launch with, was together with Ford for the Mach-E. Ah yes, because it looked familiar yeah. to me. I just did a <laughs> Ford F-150 Lightning review and I use that like pretty much every day in order to yeah. charge up at nighttime, so that's pretty cool. How did you like it? I liked it a lot, actually. I was impressed the fact because a lot of EVSCs on the market, they don't have both of the connectors where it's a 110 and a 240 hookup, so I liked the ability to be able to get a little bit more if I had the opportunity to plug it into a 240. Um, so yeah, it was it worked like a dream for us. We had no problem with it. But I noticed that you have a ton of plug options here. So it looks like you might be servicing more than just the US, right? <laughs> Absol absolutely. It's for the US, we have um, the main two connectors, what you talked about. But for the rest of the world, we, we are in the end having all the connectors that is, is needed per country. And the US is easy, but Europe is much more complicated. There's a lot of countries. There are a lot of different grid plugs that are needed. And that's what, what's perfect with our units. So if you're traveling from, from Germany to Italy to France to through um, and then back through uh, Switzerland to Germany, you, you have always the right uh, grid plug and you can charge your car overnight. And now I see you have this portable charger, but are you guys going to be getting into more of the hardware for wall boxes, for home stations? and um, quicker charging mechanism? Yeah, so let's, let's start with wall boxes first. So we're also having wall boxes in our portfolio. Um, those are developed in Germany currently and also produced mainly in Germany. Um, also the Ford wall boxes from Webasto. Um, Even the Pro, the big 80 amp one? No, not the 80 amp, but the 48 amp gotcha. is from, from us. And in Europe, we have our um, own Webasto branded chargers, um, non-connected version and fully connected versions. 
Um, high performance charging um, is brand new. We have a product in Europe um, which we produce and also sell. Talking a little bit more about the home station stuff, um, there is more bi-directional capability that's coming into the marketplace. Are you guys getting into that? What does the future hold for your EVSE division? So bi-directional charging is is the future definitely. So there, the California said a while ago, don't charge your car because it's too hot. Um, in, in a few years they will um, ask, please put, uh, plug in your car because it's very hot and we need the extra power reserve that is in all, in all the vehicles. So we are um, developing our first project, product for um, bidirectionality, which is just a uh, vehicle to load application for a large OEM as well. And our wall boxes will be ready for um, AC bidirectional charging um, in the future too. What other types of products are in the works? Because obviously you guys, like you mentioned, you're doing things in the heating and cooling space, you're doing things um, that aren't just in the EVSC market. Is What do you see with e-mobility going further for the types of products that you can offer? So we have, what we really focus on is first of all improving our current uh, mo mobile chargers. Um, the next generation is in development. You will see our prototype line out there and this new mobile charger will have features that normally a wall box has, so will be able to be integrated to a home energy management system. So it will be a much more advanced product, um, more compact, more power. Um, yeah, this is one of uh, the future products we work on as, as, um, as said, high performance charging will be something that is coming up. Now this is a very competitive industry, so there's probably been quite a few challenges for you as you've gone along the way in growing this part of the business. So can you speak to what those challenges were and how you guys have overcome them so far? Yeah, one of the main challenges is it's, it's still a very new industry. So, so regarding engineering, there's a lot to, to do, a lot to invent, a lot of problems to solve. Um, and one reason is at the moment, our customers don't have standards like they have on, on other components of the cars, so everybody is learning and that makes it of course very interesting for engineering to, to yeah, solve the problems that come up. And what we do is of course try to influence um, specifications, um, regulations to make the product as safe and reliable as possible. Are you seeing anything regulation wise um, that in the future you're trying to work towards because you can kind of see it already going that way and specifically what would that be? So one topic we work on and, and are very um, evolved is um, the revenue grade metering or in, uh, the German, in Germany it's Eichrecht, so MID metering which is needed if a charger is used in public applications or a charger is used to trade energy and this is a product where we, um, yeah, what we are currently developing and I think we have a very cost-optimized solution um, that, that has a clear advantage to competitor solutions. So you've been here for a few years now, as I understand it. How did you get in your role as the Global Director of Research and Development? That's a big task and, you know, here in California specifically is an interesting spot to come yeah. to. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started uh, my career at Webasto in the Sunroof division. Um, but after years of um, sunroof development and Webasto stepping into new uh, industries, I, I had the opportunity to um, move to the battery division. was responsible for uh, mainly for the project management at Webasto Batteries. During that time we have developed our CV standard battery, have acquired first projects for um, truck companies in uh, Europe. And then after the acquisition I had the opportunity to, to take over the engineering role here on site. And the latest change was that um, I'm not only responsible for the engineering here in the US, but also globally for all charging engineering that's going on. Yeah, and um, it's really a special place because, um, yeah, it's, it's a great combination of having this California in innovation culture combined with um, yeah, the robust skills of automotive engineering, which is in the end really our DNA of the company. So how, how many employees do you have in this facility here? So here we have about, um, on the engineering side, about 100 engineers and project managers. Um, globally, we are about 200 engineers for charging. So it's- That's big. It's big. <laughs> a lot of people, yes. So quite a few employees, but I'm guessing that there's, it's gotta be a little bit challenging because it is competitive out here as well. So how are you retaining people and get, you know, getting people to come to work here at this facility? Yeah. So I think what, what we have here is really, we have 
fun with what we do. So that, that keeps people motivated. And of course, it's the right industry. Maybe we're not here the largest employer, but it's the right industry. People want to be in the EV industry. And um, yeah, recently we had people move to EV companies and after a while they are coming back. So <laughs> that's a good sign. <laughs> so that's a good sign, obviously. And um, I think really um, we love what we do here. We're motivated. And I guess you will see it when you meet the team. Let's cool. go. All right, let's do it. All right. So where to first? So let's go to the right. So this is our test department where we do all the release tests of, and tests of all our products. And we will see today mainly the uh, testing that we do on our mobile EVSEs. So the, our team is already waiting and excited to show you what's going on here. So this is now our first test station. What we will see today, it's the temperature testing and it will be uh, presented by Marcel. This is the cold testing where we will show that the products are working at extreme low temperature without any problems. Marcel, right? Hi. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. What do you have going on here at this station? So right here we can see the station that is our uh, deep temperature testing station. So right now um, this is cooled down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. It is for uh, testing the charging unit for areas where it's getting really cold like Alaska or Northern America in the winter. So uh, yeah, let's open it up and see how it does. And oh my gosh. <laughs> you can see the icy temperature coming out. It's still a little frosty on the outside, but by the blue light, you can still indicate that the unit is still operating completely fine. Plugged in, it's charging even in these freezing cold temperatures. Wow, that's cool. So how long does it stay in this cavity for your testing? So it really depends on the customer specification, but it can stay in there for multiple days, just like in a real-life situation, how the quartz it itself can also stay out for multiple days in the cold temperatures. Very cool. So this here is a simulation box that essentially makes it seem like it is actually plugged into a vehicle here. So it's like a real-life situation with this testing. And you can see it's plugged in right here. So going all the way to the back of the unit, plugging right in, it's pretty cool. So in our real-life situations, our quartzets don't only uh, see like really cold temperatures, but also the exact opposite. So we're going to really high temperatures. And that's what Mike over there is going to show you in the next step. Oh, awesome. Hi, Mike. Hi. Nice to meet you. What do you got going here? On the opposite end of the extremes, from going from negative 42, we're here at 55C, which is about approximately 130 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so this is simulating like uh, leaving the grid cord in the uh, trunk of your car, leaving it outside in the sun, leaving it inside of your car, uh, and it'll still work at those temperatures. So you can bring it out, plug it in, and your battery will charge at full charge. This is our charging profile. So you can see during the whole charge, we're at 30 amps the whole time. This puts more charge into the car faster, so your charging time is shorter. This is our competitors, where they start losing charge as time goes by, regardless of temperature. So that's what we strive for at, uh, with our charging cords, is to be at this rate, so you can get your car charged faster. Uh, we'll take a look inside the chamber now. Ooh, looks a little scorched. <laughs> and the reason you can take and tell it's charging is our uh, charge system stroke. So it tells you that it's charging. So another uh, simulation type device down Correct. here. Yes. Plugged in. And then the amperage is over here on our load bank behind you. And here's the temperature of the unit right up here. Okay, that completes a thermal testing walkthrough. Uh, we'll move you over to Sean here. He's going to show you our water dunk test. Awesome. Nice uh, to meet you, Sean. Morning. Nice to meet you. It sounds like you have a pretty cool dunk tank here. Yes, we do. Let's see what you do for this testing. So we have one meter of water here that we're going to be dunking the test unit for 30 minutes to prove that it can survive um, immersion testing. Before we dunk this unit, let's go ahead and weigh it first. All right, let's do it. Okay, sounds good. All right, so essentially we are going to put this on here and weigh it so we can make sure no water is getting in the device. That is correct, yes. So we're at 8.325 pounds. So if you would like, uh, you can go ahead and drop it in the I'll dunk I'll do the tank. honors, all right. Yeah. Ooh. It 
And now this stays for 30 minutes, right? Yep, and just lower it all the way down to the bottom, and it'll be ready to go, and just keep this out of the, that out of the tank. All right, we're gonna come back to that in a little bit because we are gonna be plugging that in. Now we're gonna be going over to Marcel again, and he's going to be doing the ball drop test. A familiar face. Marcel, what do you have going on here? All right, right here we got our ball drop test, and as always, safety first, so I might kindly uh, yeah. ask you to put those safety glasses on for me. So, um, for the ball drop test, we got these steel balls back here. They got a diameter of two inches, and we're gonna drop them from 2.6 meters height onto our court set. This um, shows a real life situation. For example, if you got your court set in your garage and you drop some tools on it, it just has to withstand uh, the impact of, a, of an object falling onto it. And that's what this test simulates. And how much does this weigh? So this one, this ball is 1.2 pounds. Gotcha. All right, so right now we got the machine set up. You see the red laser dot right here. It's for positioning the court set. And I'm going to load the machine with the ball now. All right. <laughs> Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> and it withstand no crack, nothing. As you can see, the surface is perfectly fine, and that's what we've been expecting to see. See, not all tests with these ball bearings go terribly wrong. <laughs> all right, so we did the ball test. What's the next test? So the next test is over in the industrial uh, charging section with Yost. Awesome. Hi, Yost. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having us. There is a lot going on in this room. What is all this stuff? <laughs> well, this is our DC charging lab. So this is not automotive. This is the products we sell on the name PosiCharge. We have three product lines here. We have chargers for the, our MHE market, which is material handling, so forklifts and autonomous material handling equipment. Then right there, that is GSE, ground support equipment, chargers. So chargers for the vehicles you see running around on airports. Oh, yeah. the, the things that you see around the airplane, like the tractor that pushes the plane back and the material and the luggage handling stuff. This is a charger that we can use to test a forklift. We have a forklift battery over here. And the way it works is it, on that forklift battery is a beam it, which identifies the battery and gives information about the battery to the charger. So when we plug it in, this beam it will tell the charger what type of battery it's connected to and it will give it information about temperature and water level and that kind of stuff. And then the battery knows what to do. If it's a lithium ion battery, then the battery management system will talk to the charger and it will tell the charger what to do. So what, no matter what type of battery you plug in, it It'll should work always, together. yeah. And I can demonstrate. That'd be great. Normally you would plug in to the forklift, but now it's an extension cord. And I don't need to do anything. The charger is now communicating with the beamit, gets all kind of information. This takes a couple of seconds and then it'll show the information for the battery and it'll start charging, so. Now I see it says 20 kilowatts here. Is that the maximum rate that is? That is this charger at the moment is rated for 20 kilowatts. So now it says the battery is char it's charged to 68%. The water level is low and you see it starts charging at roughly 170 amps. <clears throat> so this is low voltage charging. This industry so far works low voltage. That's lead acid, but if this were a lithium ion, you would see the exact same thing. It would work slightly different underneath, but the user doesn't notice that. Sure. You just plug it in and it works. And we're monitoring here on the computer what's going on because we're testing. Now you do a lot of charging equipment and you do have to do some testing I see you do have some batteries here too. So do you guys produce batteries? We do. We just started producing lithium ion batteries, high voltage batteries in Germany. 
but our knowledge comes from working very closely with the battery manufacturers. So typically, any new battery that comes in the market, we work with the battery manufacturer to get a charging profile that we develop together with the battery manufacturer. The batteries that we make are more automotive oriented. Oh, but so we have the knowledge in Germany, they make those batteries within the Robusto organization. Um, and we just started making in Germany also a high voltage DC charger that goes with those batteries and obviously all other high voltage. That's a high voltage, high power charger that's just going into production now. So I don't know what, if you want to talk about these. This is our test equipment. This is the smallest in our range of test equipment. These will be very often used to test batteries. It can charge a battery and it can discharge a battery. So it's bi-directional and we use them to test our chargers. So if, instead of hooking up a battery to a charger, then we have to discharge the battery again. We use those, so we charge our charger, puts the power into these, and these put it back on the grid. Oh, okay. So we cycle the power around more or less. Interesting. So we use these as test equipment. We make them ourselves, but they're not here to be tested. We use them as test equipment. This is our new model charger. This will eventually replace the charger we just saw. And this is a test setup where we have this bracket, this support that holds two charger. What we're testing here is that the heat from one doesn't influence the heat of the air intake of the other, so they don't sure. overheat if you have two of them so close together. So that's what this test is about. So this is our latest and greatest model so for that same market. What's the big difference between this versus the one that you have over here? Slightly more modern technology, slightly better software, slightly more efficient, um, more versatile a little bit. It's just all small upgrades to make it a total better package. Um, and <clears throat> we have, these are all cloud connected mm -hmm. and these are on their way to have a better connection so that in the future they will be upgradable over the air. And the customers can already see what's going on with their batteries online and can, and can see what's going on with the chargers. And we can do remote diagnostics and with this version that will be easier and better than with the older version. Interesting. And you have like demand response capability within that software so that you can, you know, fluctuate whether you want to turn on power or turn off power at certain times in that order to help. Will, that will be possible in the future. Um, we're technically ready for it. It's just, it's not implemented at the moment. Very interesting. So I think your next visit is with our durability colleagues. All right, let's make our way to durability. Great, right, there's Sean again, right? Good, <laughs> Good to see you again. What do we have going on here? So welcome to Mechanical Testing Station. We have this right here is the uh, insertion extraction um, hot disconnect for the grid cords to our CCIDs. Uh, basically it has our connector to CCID testing. So that's interesting though, you have the connection right here at the cable. So if people are actually pulling at that point, mm -hmm. it is putting force on the connector there. That is correct. So very good durability testing and yep. real world application where people are gonna actually pull from there instead of from this bottom yeah. part of the device. Absolutely. And we cycle these uh, 10,000 times for hot disconnect. Wow. So it, it truly is, uh, puts a strain on our on our units, and but they come out perfect every time. And then I see a lot more going on over here. What's yep. happening with the connectors here? So this is our bin relief, uh, strain relief test. And um, what we're doing is we're testing our bin relief system to make sure there is no breakage, um, either on the uh, outside of our jackets or even on internally. So after we do our cycle testing, which goes at ambient and hot, our extreme temperatures are at hot at 80 degrees C and minus 40 degrees C. 
Um, we cut, we you know, verify the outside of the jacket is okay. And internally, we'll cut these open and verify they're good internally. Interesting, so even in hot, extreme cold, extreme hot temperatures, this cable, even when it's bending around like this, is yep. gonna stay intact. And you have, I see, the... The CCID, so yeah. we, we check all our bend relief systems. So on both sides of it. Both sides of it, exactly. So all our bend reliefs are verified and checked. And how many cycles for this? So this depends on specifications from our customers but some of them are go up to 10,000, where we've had some of like our wall box systems where they do 6,000, 2,000, and 2,000, to um, some of these that'll vary where our customers will want to run like 250, um, 400, 400, and then repeat that up to uh, 3,000 times. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so it really just, just depends on the customer. And then finally, what do we have over here? So this is a very interesting system. Um, this is where we're actually testing the durability of our coupler systems. And it's not only just testing, it's testing the trigger as well. And it looks like it's quite a bit of force too that it's putting on the trigger there, but you're going in and out of the connector just to ensure that that's like a smooth transition and nothing breaks. Smooth transition and it's the longevity of it. Um, these also will go up to um, 10,000 cycles and um, that over a lifetime that these can last. So, and again, it also varies from customer to customer. Some are more, some are less. All right, well, I think it's been about 30 minutes. Oh yeah. With the dunk tank. Yes. All right, let's go grab that EDSC. You got it. All right, hi, Matt. Hi. It's been 30 minutes, right? It has. Okay, it's time to take this out. And we're gonna actually take it right back to the scale to weigh it to make sure no water has gotten in. All right. <laughs> it's <is> leaking out. <laughs> is designed that water will come out of that coupler. Let me give it a quick wipe down. Just about the same as if we took it out. All right, now it's time that we go plug this right in because we need to see that it'll work even if it got wet. I'll take this housing. Okay, plug it in. All right, and immediately it looks like we're already charging. Now that we've seen that the water test worked, let's put it to the test by running it over with a heavy EV, the Mach-E here. All right, let's inspect it. Well, it looks like it's dirty, but pass the test. You have a lot of products that you're building right now, but what does the future hold? It looks like you got some stuff over here that looks pretty interesting. Of course, we are not, we are continuing to developing 
and over there you see the pilot lines of our next generation cord set, um, which will be much improved in terms of package, in terms of power and also in terms of connectivity. So with our next generation at the end, of the mobile EVSEs and, and wall boxes will, will um, yeah, become more one in the end. So how did you like it? It's really clean. It's really cool to see what you guys are doing here because not a lot of people get the behind the curtain peek on companies like yours that are really pushing forward the whole EV movement. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for having us here. It was fascinating seeing all the testing and even some of the stuff that you have coming in the future. And I'd love to explore more of your facilities. I heard you have one in Michigan that specifically deals with batteries. So. That's right. Yes, that's <laughs> we got to take right. another visit here so, pretty soon. Thank you so much for your visit. And I hope we see you next time with maybe the Generation 2 or batteries or the other cool stuff that will bust us. That'd be awesome. Thank you guys so much for watching this facilities tour. And I hope you learned a lot as much as I did, really. And until next time, drive, fly, ride. Go electric. <laughs>